welcome to this Christ Church service, Holy Eucharist, on this the fifth Sunday after Lent, or of Lent, and a special welcome to those visiting with us this morning. Our service begins printed in your bulletin and also on page 319 in the Book of Common Prayer. Bless the Lord who forgiveth all our sins. His mercy endureth forever. Hear what our Lord Jesus saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent. According to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who alone canst order the unruly wills and affections of sinful people, grant unto thy people that we may love the thing which thou commandest and desire that which thou dost promise, that so amongst the sundry and manifold changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. 
The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. We'll read Psalm 119 responsibly by half verse. How shall a young man cleanse his way? I your words. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not stray from your I treasure your promise in my heart. And I do not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. With my lips will I recite all the judgments of your mouth. I have taken greater delight in the way of your decrees than in all manner of riches. I will meditate on your commandments and give attention to your ways. My delight is in your statutes. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Hebrews. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to the Lord. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. 
Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Our scriptures for today are giving us a framework for understanding why Jesus had to suffer, why he had to go through the events of the final week of his life where he endured unthinkable pain and suffering on our behalf to defeat the hold of sin and death over us and to restore us to a right relationship with God. It's a plan that was put in place for the redemption of God's people before time began and sin ever entered the picture. We already see this plan unfolding long before God had formed for himself the nation of Israel as the people of God, long before the giving of the law and the establishment of the old covenant, when the groundwork was being laid in God's relationship with Abraham. When Abram, whose name had yet to be changed by God to Abraham, was returning home from a victorious triumph in defeating a combined army of multiple kings and restoring a large group of captives to their homes along with their worldly goods, he encountered Melchizedek, the king and priest of Salem, which much later would be known as Jerusalem. Abr Abram could very easily have been most impressed with his accomplishment and started to become puffed up with pride for the great thing he had done on behalf of these oppressed people and the very impressive victory he had won against incredible odds. But Melchizedek, a priest of the Most High God, met him on the way home. Now remember, this is probably out in the middle of nowhere. He just happens to be there on Abram's way home to remind him that it was God who had won the victory. 
Blessed be God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand, he said. Many have speculated whether this might be Christ making a cameo appearance in time, keeping Abram on track. It reminds me a little bit of an Alfred Hitchcock movie where the director puts himself into the movies as an extra just to remind the viewers that he is there in the story calling the shots even if you don't see him. Abram gave to Melchizedek, it's a hard word to say, a tithe. I was very impressed, Sally, by the way you handled that. (laughs) A tenth of all the wealth he had taken in the battle to honor God and acknowledge who the true victor had been. Although he seems to come out of nowhere from an unknown people, Melchizedek was God's instrument, a royal priest established and ordained by God. Much later in time, after the Ten Commandments had been given and the Old Covenant established, Jeremiah comes on the scene as a prophet to God's people. They have now broken their covenant with God, following after other gods and trusting in worldly allies rather than trusting in the Lord to protect and lead them. Jeremiah warned the people of the coming exile, but he also spoke of a time in the future when God would restore his people and establish a new covenant, one much stronger than the old covenant, which was based on the keeping of the law. This is the only place in the Old Testament where the term new covenant is used. In this new covenant, God's law would be placed within them, not just on tablets to be held out in front of them. It would be written on their hearts. For the Jewish people, the heart was the organ that was considered the seat of reason, intelligence, and will. For our understanding, we might say that God has written his law on our minds. This is essentially what we're referring to when we speak of our conscience. Whether we want to do what we know is right or not, God has written an understanding of right and wrong in our hearts and in our minds. Where the old covenant was established through the shedding of the blood of animals, the new covenant is established through the shedding of the blood of God's Son, the Christ. God essentially paid the price of the new covenant with his own blood, if you will, for Jesus was both fully human and fully divine. Only he was capable of paying such a price. This new covenant depended on Christ, not on the fickle nature of human will in any given moment. It had a permanence to it, an unshakable quality that the first covenant had lacked. Jeremiah 17, 11 said, their sin was engraved in their hearts and in the horns of the altar. The horns were on either on the corners of the altar and they were what was taken hold of by a sinner when they were crying out for mercy. Jeremiah is saying that their sins were written on those horns. Now, in the new covenant, God's law has been engraved in our hearts and the blood of Christ has washed clean the altar. We can come there as a repentant sinner knowing we will find forgiveness because of the price that Jesus has paid for us. The Lord says, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. He said in Hebrews, although he, Jesus, was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The meaning of having been made perfect has the sense 
of being complete, to accomplish a prescribed goal or to finish something. Jesus was already perfect, but in his suffering and death on the cross, he embraced the fullness of our suffering and the pain of sin and death. He completed or accomplished his goal of establishing the new covenant, one that is made not just with the Israelites, the people of the law, but with whoever serves and follows Christ. He accomplished on the cross paying the price for our sins. Our reading in John is essentially John's version of the suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Gentiles coming to meet Jesus is a sign to him that the time for his death has come. When he says, my soul is troubled, the word carries a sense of turbulent, roiling waters. He's in the deep inner agony of wrestling with the desire to be saved from having to go through with what he knows is ahead, while knowing he must go through it to accomplish the the purpose that has been set before him. In the church in Jerusalem that's built around the stone slab where Jesus is believed to have prayed and sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's an iron fence that stands around that slab making a giant rectangle and it stands about 18 inches high and the fence is crafted into the shape of long thorns, like the kind of thorns that Jesus would have worn in the crown of thorns when he was tortured before he was crucified. It's as if while he was praying in the garden his heart was already experiencing the pain of those thorns as his head would be later. It's no accident that in the Gospel of John, the last words of Jesus on the cross are, it is finished. The job has been completed. It's accomplished. The establishment of the new covenant is made perfect in the blood of the Son of God. Because this new covenant was established through the suffering and death of God's Son on our behalf, our suffering is seen in a different light. There is nothing that we can go through that Christ hasn't endured on our behalf. Truly, he is with us in our suffering. The truth of God's sovereignty is not impacted when we go through terrible things because he uses our suffering to draw us into a deeper knowledge of him and a closer walk with the Lord when we trust him through it. The greatest witnesses to the power of Christ and the unshakable belief that we will be raised with him is the witness of those who have suffered and even been martyred for their faith, trusting God through it, even praising God in their suffering, remaining steadfast in their faith, and forgiving those who persecute them. Moses is a 17-year-old boy growing up in Nigeria in a Christian family in a part of the world where being Christian was and is extremely dangerous. Attacks by the Fulani Fulani Muslim extremists, or Boko Haram, are common in that area, brutally murdering Christians and often burning their homes to drive them away. Moses' family attended church every Sunday, and at night he and his younger two siblings would gather with his parents for devotions. As is true of most of us, Moses wasn't worried. Even though he'd heard about attacks on Christians, he never thought the violence would impact him or those he loved. One morning in April of 2021, his father left for his farm and never returned. His body was later found by villagers. He'd been struck on the back with a machete and shot in the head. 
The murder followed the pattern of other recent kidnappings and murders of local people by Fulani, Fulani extremists. Not long after his father was killed, his mother died. Yet even after the loss of both of his parents, Moses continued to grow in his faith and learn to increasingly trust and rely on God. He refused to allow persecution and even the risk of losing his own life to keep him from going to church services where he sings in the choir or to keep him from telling others about Christ. Ten years ago, ISIS militants painted the homes of Christians and their churches with the Arabic letter N, signifying Nazarene or follower of Jesus Christ, as they invaded parts of Iraq. This symbol served as a warning to convert to Islam, leave or be killed. Christians were forced to pay high ransom costs to get their loved ones returned. Pastors were tortured and even beheaded. A report was given to the UN of this time in 2022 stating the Islamic State extremists committed crimes against humanity and war crimes against the Christian community after it seized about a third of the country. A book titled I Am N was written about the stories of 50 of the Christians who lived through the nightmare of that time. Those interviewing the Christians who had been persecuted cited seven characteristics that were commonly witnessed among them. They demonstrated personal sacrifice, courage, perseverance, unshakable faithfulness, Christ-like forgiveness, and joy. The joy they have in Christ is the one thing no one could take away from them. The love of Christ within them couldn't be stolen from them. Today, countless Christians suffer terrible persecution for their faith every day. But their suffering and even their death because it is accompanied by faithful obedience to the Lord and a love and forgiveness towards their adversaries, continues to demonstrate that unshakable love of Christ in a way that nothing else can. When we come to those times when we face suffering from within or without, and we must decide Will I honor and obey the Lord in my suffering, even though the road seems so hard? We can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the victory has already been won. God remains sovereign, and we face those battles for the joy that lies before us, knowing nothing can separate us from the love of God. Our suffering is temporal, but the love of God and our life with the Lord is eternal. No matter what we might face, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave his life for us. This is why we continue to hear so many accounts of God's faithful people facing such great opposition and suffering, yet continuing to live with love, forgiveness, and even joy in the midst of their suffering. They count it all as loss in view, of the no, in view of the value, the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, their Lord. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith in the one who is faithful in all things by saying together the Nicene Creed found on page 326. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, 
the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church in the world. Let us praise God for the many thanksgivings in our lives. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that thou hast done for us. We thank thee for the splendor of thy whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. Please add your own prayers of thanksgiving, either silently or aloud. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all whom you have made, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thine divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy, give grace, O heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially the most reverend Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, the right reverend Rob Wright, our own bishop, the Reverend Cynthia Knapp, our rector, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. Lord, in your mercy. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, in your mercy. We beseech thee also to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, especially Joe Biden, our president, Kamala Harris, our vice president, Brian Kemp, our governor, and Lester Miller, our mayor, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Lord, in your mercy, 
Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that, rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. Lord, in your mercy, and we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor Angie, Bailey, Bill, Bonnie, Clay, Diane, Dixie, Ed, Eleanor, Elizabeth, Flo, Gary, George, Gibson, Gracie, Rabbi Greg, Griffin, Helen, Hughes, Jamie, Jerry, Jordan, Karen, Kelly, Ken, Libby, Lowe, Malcolm, Margaret, Markisha, Mildred, Nancy, Pammy, Pete, Phyllis, Susie, Tommy, Tony, Tracy, and Tricia, and all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We also pray for those serving in the military, especially Austin, Cameron, Charlie, Georgia, Joe, John, Rose, and Sam. Please add your own prayers, either silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. We remember this day Joel Plant Hatcher, for whom the altar greenery is given in loving memory and to the glory of God. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. brief announcements. We have this week uh, some very special opportunities coming up for you that are not to be missed. Tuesday, there are two different times during the day. Uh, I believe one is at 10 and one is at 2 when Susan Welsh will be giving tours of uh, our stained glass windows. And I'm not sure if you know, she will be telling you the history behind our Good Samaritan window, but this is considered the most important piece of art in all of Georgia, and is also the most, most important stained glass window that Tiffany ever did. So uh, she will tell you more about that if you come to the tour. And there will also be refreshments offered in the cloister room following the tours. Also, Thursday evening is a very special concert that is being given by our own music ministry that will be accompanied by a full symphony orchestra, and it's called Love's Eternal Home. It's going to be done in memory of Jack Manette as a special offering, and it will be phenomenal, I know. So I encourage you to come to that Thursday evening at 7.30 here in the church. Any other announcements? The rest are printed in your bulletin. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice to God.
continues on page 333. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was in every way tempted as we are, yet did not sin, by whose grace we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that, by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church 
may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our down, bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Ghost all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we're bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We do not presume to come to this side table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank Thee for that Thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of Thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members incorporate in the mystical body of Thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of Thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech Thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with Thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as Thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with Thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. In the name of the Father Almighty, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
forth in the name of